Greetings, everyone. I'm Helen Hudson, president of the League of Women Voters of Montgomery County, Indiana. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our November 2020 virtual Lunch with the League. Lunch with the League is a monthly forum designed to inform the public about issues of community concern. Often these issues are of state and national concern as well, as is certainly the case with today's program. Black Lives Matter. What should we know? This is the eighth in our special 2020 series of Lunch with the League programs online. I invite you to view any and all of our earlier programs on our website, Facebook page, or YouTube channel. We've covered topics as varied as the coronavirus, redistricting, voting safely, living in rural Indiana as a Wabash urban student of color, vote by mail, Indiana forestry farming, and more. The League of Women Voters is proud to be nonpartisan, just like the NAACP. Neither supporting nor opposing candidates nor political parties at any level of government, but always working on issues of vital concern to members and to the public at large. Please join us if you are not already a member. Visit our webpage for more information. At this point, I would like to introduce our guests for today. We are delighted to have with us Latasha Everson, Associate Director of Student Engagement at DePauw University. Latasha is a 2009 graduate of DePauw University, and I do believe and have just confirmed that earlier in her career, she was a valued employee and beloved employee of Wabash College, but was drawn back to her alma mater in 2014. In addition to her professional work, Latasha gives so much to her community as a leader in the Greencastle NAACP and as a leader in her faith community. Latasha and her husband, Joel, are co-pastors and founders of Harvest House Church in Coatesville, Indiana. She and Joel, along with fellow producer, also broadcast Sightcast, a broadcast for and beyond faith communities. On a recent, that would be last June, broadcast of Around the Table, the Zeitcast Discussion Forum, Latasha presented an hour-long conversation about why Black Lives Matter within the Christian faith tradition and beyond, especially for those of us living in small, mainly rural Indiana communities. I encourage you to listen to and watch Latasha give this excellent talk at some point. Latasha describes herself as dedicated to the cause of racial justice and black liberation through policy change. We are so honored to have her here with us today. Thank you so much, Latasha, for joining us. Thank you, I'm happy to be here today. Also along with us today, uh, with us today are two guest questioners. Please meet Vicki Hudson Swisher, our leading local African-American historian. Melon and mentors and countless other community actions, both inside her historic AME church and elsewhere in our community. Vicki is a member of the board of the League of Women Voters in Montgomery County. Thank you so much. Our second questioner today is Alan Johnson, Jr. Alan is a sophomore at Wabash College and an active member of the Malcolm X Institute. He was gracious enough to step up to the plate just last night when student president of the MXI, Kenny Coleman, uh, realized he was unable to be with us at this time because one of his classes meets at the same hour. Alan, may I ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself? Where are you from? Do you know your major yet? And what campus things awaken your passions? All right, well, uh, thank you. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here. My name is Alan Johnson, Jr., currently a saw. Um, as uh, Ms. Hudson said, I am a psychology major um, with a African-American um, plan to also read, to double minor in rhetoric, a member of the golf team here at Wabash College, as well as an avid musical theater fan, 
Atlanta Pacer fan and Indianapolis Colts fan. Oh, okay. So I, I enjoy a lot of those things as well as um, getting, getting recently involved and looking at politics as well as the voting system um, and being able to be a part of different conversations and um, talks such as these. So I'm very excited to hear what Ms. Latasha has to say today and um, hopeful to learn something new. Okay. Excellent. Beautiful, Alan. And thank you. That's just what we love to hear from 20-year-olds that are getting interested in the voting process and learning how things work and seeing how things can go. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce you to Marco Dees, cornerstone of our Lunch with the League programs. Marco coordinates Lunch with the League speakers and is also production manager and editor for these virtual programs. No small task in and of themselves, but especially for someone working full time. So thank you so much, Marco, for making this all possible, and your wonderful work. So welcome everyone. And it is now my delight to turn today's program over to Ms. Latasha Everson. Latasha, you are such a very busy person, not only with your working and educating your Wabash students, but also with your second life as an educated <laughs> worker in this era when we need so much to learn and so much to stay in conversation. We can't thank you enough for being with us today. So Latasha, please take it away. Well, my goodness, what a wonderful welcome. And uh, I thank you again for the invitation to be here with you all to discuss what are such important um, matters uh, of our time. Um, I wanted to start today by just giving, Helen did such a great job and um, I'm humbled at her, her wonderful, beautiful words uh, of an introduction, but just to kind of give a background to who I am so that you know where I'm coming from. So I am a black woman. I was raised, born and raised in Greencastle, Indiana, which is just about 30 minutes from Crawfordsville. So not very far. Our towns are very similar um, in both size and makeup. Um, so being born here, I was raised and educated with mostly white children. Um, and then when I, decided that I was going to go to college, I went to DePaul University, which is in Greencastle, Indiana. I wanted to go far, far away because I said, I've got to get out of here and see people who look like me and people who don't look like me, but they can teach me something else. And so, um, however, um, as is the case with most students who are in a low socioeconomic um, status, I had to go where I could get the best financial aid package. And that just happened to be in my backyard in, at DePaul University. And so I went there, um, graduated, and got my degree in communication. Um, DePaul actually turned out to be a very good experience for me because while I wanted to be away, it gave me a sense of a global experience because it brought people who didn't look like me, who didn't talk like me, who had lived differently from me to me. <laughs> so, um, and in that, in that vein, I feel like I am an educator in all aspects of my life. So I have a communications degree. I um, graduated and got into finance. And then from there went and worked at Wabash for eight years, which I absolutely adored. And now I'm back at my own uh, alma mater, DePaul University, um, in the Hubbard Center for Student Engagement. And so, so much of what I do is, is helping students to have those experiences like I had. Um, and, and in terms of education, to see something broader than where they've been. Um, so I was raised by a single mom. I have a sister and a brother. My brother actually just graduated from Wabash this past May um, with a rhetoric degree. So uh, he is loving his life. I got to spend some time with him after seven months of not seeing him um, this past Sunday. So um, small family, um, single mom, work two jobs, um, very hard worker. Uh, she also was born in Greencastle. Um, so our family has been here a long time. My mom has told me stories about things that she's seen as um, 
Greencastle used to be much more diverse in that IBM was uh, a company that was here. There were many black families. When IBM left, the family said, we have to go where we can find jobs. And so that diminished the diversity in our town. We've gotten some of that back with the university, but um, that's where I've lived, learned, loved, played. Um, I have uh, really decided within myself that it is important that I give back to my community um, because I want it to look like what I know it can look like. So I'm involved in a lot of different organizations, the NAACP being one of them. I am on their exec board and uh, help to restart our branch. So just like Crawfordsville, we used to have a branch. It, it basically just kind of fizzled out. And with um, all of the civil unrest and social injustice, our little town, our little uh, uh, town spokes said, hey, this is something that we need to have. And so we reinstated it, um, went through all of the, the process to do that. And man, I am so thankful that it's here. I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of it. So I do try to get back in that way civically. And again, in terms of who I feel I am, just that education, being an educator and trying to make sure that people understand the real importance of the work that we're trying to do. So that brings me to our topic of Black Lives Matter. What should we know? I could spend days telling you what you should know, but I'm going to give you what I hope is a succinct and very clear understanding of what I feel is so important for you to know right now. So as of May 25th, the murder of George Floyd, which was so um, globally seen, uh, it really started what we, what we probably understand now as the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I'm going to distinguish for you the Black Lives Matter organization and the Black Lives Matter movement. But what we really understand right now is the hashtag, the marches, the protests, the things that we see, the signs as a movement. Um, the movement really started, again, May 25th with the, the murder of George Floyd. There was such um, it was such an atrocity and so uh, visual uh, for all of us to see that there was nothing that we could do other than get to the streets and say, this is injustice, we are outraged, we will not be quiet, right? And so um, when you think about the Black Lives Matter organization, it began in 2013. Again, it began from a, a travesty, a tragedy with Trayvon Martin. It was formed by three women who said, we cannot do this anymore. We are sick of police brutality and our children uh, being killed in the streets. And so the actual organization began in 2013. It was the acquittal of, of the murder of Trayvon Martin that really sparked that and is now a, a global organization in, in U, the US, the UK and Canada. So we are seeing the Black Lives Matter movement globally, but the actual organization is also global. Um, its mission, and I really, I have such a passion to talk about the organization as well as the movement. They're one and the same, yet they're different, right? Um, but I have such a passion to talk about it because I think we hear so many things and there's such disinformation that is purposely propagated for us to think things that aren't true. And so I always tell people who I have personal conversations with about Black Lives Matter when they have, you know, pushback or questions, go online and look it up. <laughs> it's literally right there. You can go to their website, you can read what their mission statement is. It's very transparent. So if you have questions, I encourage you, please go to the organization's website and, and read what they're about. I will give you a very um, short understanding. So as I said, it's a global organization. Their mission is to eradicate white supremacy, to build local power, to um, intervene in violence to black communities. That's the mission. Um, it's made up of political and social movements, right? Because you gotta have policy change to have real change. 
um, and in a very social way, right? It's through marches, protests, um, direct action. Uh, Nonviolent civil disobedience, right? So we hear so many things about, oh, Black Lives Matter is violent and they want to destroy things and there's so much destruction and all of those things. Black Lives Matter, the organization and the movement, their heart, their commitment is to nonviolent civil disobedience. And we've seen that since Martin Luther King. We've seen that time and time and time again. So as you are understanding what this movement is and how it began, please know that that is the heartbeat of the movement. It's made up of activists and what I love uh, to call liberators. People who, you know, I think about with the abolitionist movement and the people who, who white people who said, this is wrong, we have to do something, slavery is an atrocity. And I think about the people now who are so, have been so moved, whether because they have experienced this personally or because they realize that even if I don't experience it personally, it still affects me. Um, who said, I'm going to be a liberator. I'm going to join this cause because I know that collective liberation helps me as much as it helps you, right? And so the movement really is a beautiful uh, gathering of people who to come together for a common purpose to say, humanity deserves to be respected and recognized and to have fair housing and education and healthcare, all of those things that as citizens of this country, we all deserve to have an equality. And so that's really what Black Lives Matter, the organization and the movement do. It is a demonstration. Again, since May, we have seen across the world, it lights a fire in me because when I see all of these people, I think we are not alone. We are not alone. Look at everyone who's showed up and showed out and spoke up during a global pandemic to say enough is enough, we are not going to stand for this anymore. And so it is, it's direct action, it's a showcasing of, of the injustices. You know, you go to the marches and you see pictures of all of the murders. You see quotes, slogans, um, phrases to say, this is the injustice that I'm fighting against. Um, it's a call for change. You know, if you've been to a protest or if you've, um, seen one, then, then you know that it is an organized event. It is uh, a place where people come together to, do, to lament, to vent, to shout, to do all of these things, but it's also a time to be educated, to know mm -hmm. about policy, how you can get into um, making legislative change, how you register to vote, all of those things, right? So it's a call for change in many ways that's being demonstrated during protests, during sit-ins, rallies, all of the things that the Black Lives Matter movement has done. And I know because I've been to some of the Black Lives Matter uh, rallies in Crawfordsville, just how um, beautiful and diverse all of these protests are. I've done Greencastle, Indianapolis, Crawfordsville. Um, and each one is a little bit different in what they're doing, but all geared towards how do we end injustice? How do we educate people about facts and actuality? How do we share our stories so that people understand these are the experiences I'm having. My skin is a darker shade than yours. And so because of that, let me share my experience with you. Stories matter, stories change things. And so whether you go to one rally or a thousand protests, they're all gonna be a little bit different, but with the same sentiment, right? And so Black Lives Matter, the movement and the organization, the movement is all of the things you're seeing. The organization is what three women who came together to say, we've got to do something to change legislation. We've got to do something to end the over-policing in Black communities. We have to do something to stop the murder of Black and brown bodies. So they really do work together, but we see them because of the global nature of the movement um, in different ways. So I hope that all of that makes sense. Um, a lot of times 
we get um, pushback with Black Lives Matter about defund the police, right? So in, in my thinking today for this conversation of what sh we should know, that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Because I think defund the police is such a, um, it's like a trigger word for some people, a trigger phrase, um, because they think that means abolish the police. And in some cases, I think that that might be the right thing to do. But defund the police really simply means divesting funds. So in what you need to know about Black Lives Matter, because the missional statement is that um, we're, we are eradicating white supremacy and building local power to intervene in, in violence and over-policing of Black communities. Defund the police is a very major phrase that you're going to hear from Black Lives Matter because over-policing in black and brown communities often means the death of black and brown bodies that are for no reason, right? There's no cause. A, in my opinion, even if there is, you know, someone who is um, not obeying what you're telling them to do, or if they're being belligerent, that doesn't mean they should die, right? There's due process. You don't get to be judge, jury, and executioner. So um, the over-policing of black and brown communities um, means that we have this phrase called defund the police. Defund the police is divesting funds. So that could be an over or an excess of budget that that money goes elsewhere or reductions to budget, right? Because we understand that some of these um, police uh, administration, they have, they have more money than they actually need to operate. And so looking at how do we divest those funds to police departments, um, uh, from the police departments and reallocate it to non-policing forms. What do I mean by non-policing forms? Because I think people get so um, worried, right? They're like, well, if we don't have, you know, police or if we don't have enough funding for police, then that just it's all chaos and all, all kinds of craziness is going to break out. But when you really sensibly think about if you divest those funds and you put them into other forms like public safety and community support, um, social services, youth services, housing, education, healthcare, all of those things, you're, you're likely to have, and we've literally seen this in cities that have, have adopted this mentality and this, this um, ideology, you literally see crime rate goes down, you see people actually getting the help that they need because we're addressing the actual problems, right? And so defund the police has this really bad stigma. And, you know, I've heard, had people who have said to me, well, you guys just need to change the terminology. And I'm like, why? Defund the whatever has been used for many things, healthcare, education, women's rights, all of the defund, defund has been a term that has been used for years. But when it comes to this, right, because it is this, oh no, now there's going to be this total chaos that we can't control. It becomes this phrase that is so, such a stigma. Um, but I, I want everyone to understand what it really means and that it is a very, in my opinion, helpful ideology if we could adopt it. Um, what I love about divesting those funds is that it really addresses real issues like poverty and homelessness and mental disorders. When you give people the tools for the things that are causing them real problems, you have less problems, <laughs> right? If you can address poverty, if you can address homelessness, if you can address mental disorders, We've, we've you know, heard this example, but I'll say it again. If you have somebody who has a mental disorder and they're on the street and they are in a state of whatever that mental disorder is causing them to be in, and a police officer who is not trained for that scenario comes, the likelihood of it becoming a bad outcome greatly, greatly heightens, right? Versus if you have somebody who is trained in mental disorders and social services, they can de-escalate that situation and get the person the proper help that they need. How is this not something that seems sensible in all manners, right? 
So defund the police is a big, big thing. When we talk about Black Lives Matter, we also think about Black liberation. I said earlier that it's made up of activists and liberators, and we talk about Black liberation. And so some people will say, well, what does that mean? What do we need to know about Black liberation, and what are you being liberated from? Black liberation is it's within the movement to say we need to be liberated from over policing we need to be liberated from not having access to many things when you think about 400 years of slavery 75 years of jim crow you are so far removed from access from wealth from education that you have to become you know um you have to, to have something, a movement, uh, something that says, okay, these are the things that we need to be liberated from. Black liberation needs to happen so that we can thrive in having housing that's affordable and adequate, that we can thrive in areas of education and jobs, careers, that we can thrive in having access to health care and all of the things that, again, every single citizen, every single person who lives in this country should have access to. I love, in my mind, I think about Black liberation as a Black woman. I am one million percent down for the cause. But when I think about it, I also think about collective liberation, which I talked about earlier. Because when, when you think about collective liberation, you're thinking about systemic change. And I know that we've heard that systemic, we've heard that word a lot in the last several months, systemic racism, systemic poverty, systemic all of the things. But when I think about Black liberation and collective liberation, it really is systemic change. It's looking at the things that caused the injustices, the um, inequalities, the inequities. It's looking at all of the things that caused that and then saying, okay, how do we change it? How do we get inside of the thing to change it? And oftentimes that comes with policy change, right? Martin Luther King was so brilliant in, in many ways. I wish to have a fraction of his heart and, and intelligence, but to say, you know, so many people say, well, hearts and minds need to change. And as somebody who comes from a faith community, you know, we have, a, my husband and I have a church. Um, yes, hearts and minds, that's, that's a wonderful thing, right? But I can't wait for hearts and minds to change because in the meantime, people are being murdered in many ways, not just by force, by not having enough to eat, by not having home to sleep in, by not being able to have education. So yes, hearts and minds need to change, but first I just need policy change so that there are consequences to those actions. Um, so systemically looking at how do we get inside of these systems and fix them. Um, and, you know, I often say, well, the system was not built for people like me. So um, it's not broken. It was made to be this way. So what do we need to do to dismantle it and build it for every single person within this country being represented. So collective liberation is that looking at that systemic change and how we do it. It recognizes, and I think that this is so beautiful because in what has been such a polarized um, season in many ways, both with the pandemic, with racial injustice, all of those things, collective liberation looks at and recognizes that all of our struggles are connected. They really are. And if we work together, looking at how we respectfully care for and understand each one of our, our humanness, um, how we fight the systems of oppression. Um, because we know that within the systems of oppression, everyone suffers. So um, collective liberation is an action. Black liberation is an action. And it, it actively works to dismantle economic, political, and social systems that cause division, that cause extreme harm. 
to me, poverty is one of the greatest violence and harms that we've done to our to our community, to our our nation, um, because it is something that is intentionally and inherently um, made so that the people who are at the top continue to be at the top and the people who are at the bottom continue to be at the bottom and they don't have access to anything to get them out of the bottom. There's not even maybe a mindset to understand where the access is to get out of the bottom. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there's, there's so many things that um, we, we are seeing in our world, um, but in particular with Black Lives Matter, it is always back to eradicating white supremacy and giving power to groups, organizations, people to help with the over-policing and violence in Black and Brown communities. Um, if you don't remember anything else please remember that that the mission is not to cause harm or violence or destruction or division which i hear a lot of times oh black lives matter just wants to divide or they want something more than what i have nope it's just about equality and it's about stopping violence that's literally it it's not anything more than um just being able to survive and live without being um, targeted, without being having excessive force used, without police brutality, simply because our skin is a darker color. So Black Lives Matter, again, the heartbeat is nonviolence, civil disobedience, to shout out injustice in the streets, in legislative offices, calling your, your uh, legislators to say over and over again, I do not support this, um, calling the jails when those of us who are arrested <laughs> uh, because we've been protesting, you know, to say they need to be released. Um, it's doing work. So it's not something that I'm a very active person. I belong to a lot of organizations in my community because I think that's what I need to be doing. But this movement is an action that may just look like for you giving money, donating. It may look like you calling people. It may look like you coming out to protest. It may look like you educating yourself in anti-racism um, training. It may look like you understanding what white fragility is or what whiteness is. It may be, it may look like you understanding or listening to somebody who looks different from you and, and hearing their story and allowing that to impact you and move you to change. Um, it is an action. It's something that we actively do because if we don't actively do it, nothing actively happens, right? There's no reaction. And mm -hmm. so we continue to see all of these, um, this direct action because it works. <laughs> we know that it works. Applying pressure, that's what protests, it's an agitation. It is the agitation that you, we just continue to give until something happens. It's what the women's rights, the suffragettes, it's what they did. They just kept agitating. In fact, you hear, yes, I love your flag. You hear um, so many stories from the legislators that said, we just got tired of them continuing to do this. And so we decided that we would go ahead and let them have it, you know? So it's like continue, continuing to apply that pressure, continuing to agitate in a nonviolent way to say, we're not going anywhere. This is important to me. This is important to the person next to me. This is important to our country, to our nation, to our children, to our elderly, to every person here. So we're not going to stop. So it is a very active movement. Um, I love that we have Black Lives Matter signs in yards. I love that I can go to my campus. I see them in the office windows. I love that it's become this thing that probably the organizers never ever imagined it could be. It's bigger than them. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than us. It is a movement and it's so beautiful and widespread and I, I i sincerely hope and wish and pray that people understand what it is and not just the negative 
disinformation that they hear it is. There are literal facts. There is actuality, there is reality. I know that within our, the time that we're living in, there is this thing that is trying to discredit facts and to make things seem like something that they are not. Um, this movement and organization is very transparent in its intentions in, in, and in its, um, its actions. I have said this to many people, but you know, when you go to a Black Lives Matter protest that's organized by a Black Ma Lives Matter organization, you get a list of things and it is rules. It is, you have to wear a mask. If this is something where we're not marching and we're going to be closed, you need to be social distancing. We are not here to incite violence. We are here to be civilly disobedient. Um, they give you so many things that, that you have to abide by. And when you, when you see that and you know that, and you know, another point in, in all of that is that the Black Lives Matter protests organized by Black Lives Matter organizations will tell you this is when we're starting and this is when we're ending. Why do you think they do that? Well, the reason that they do that is because you have outliers who try to do things that are counter to the movement, but so that people think the movement's doing it. So we say, nope, we're here from this time to this time. If things are happening before or after, that is not us. We are not, um, don't put our name on it. Now, it happens anyways, right? But to see and know the true nature of how these things are organized um, and the spirit behind it is it's beautiful. And to see these people coming together um, from all walks of life um, is a quite incredible thing. And I'm thankful to be a part of it. I'm thankful that um, I get to see and be involved. It, it breaks my heart that, you know, we're here, but I also say that so many of the things that I've seen and heard around my community, within um, people who have different, differing opinions from me in, in many ways, socially, politically, religiously, etc. cetera, um, this is the, to me, this is the fracture that needed to happen. It is the break that needed to happen to demonstrate, to showcase all of the underlying stuff that needs changed. You know, we've seen violence time and again, and now with all of the technology that we have to record and showcase. Um, but in many ways, as tragic as those things are, it's as if, well, this happened and now we just move on. But collectively, when we come together, like with the Black Lives Matter movement, we get to dig deeper and say, and here's the root of the thing that caused this atrocity. And we get to make real change with it. So it really is quite amazing. And I think I've talked for 30 minutes. <laughs> and I'm so sorry. I, I tried to be a very good um, steward of my time. And I wrote down the time when I started. And it has. It's been well, 32 minutes, actually. So um, I, I guess at this point, maybe, um, Helen, I don't know if you want me to address anything else. I do. I, I've done a lot of these, and so I have definitions I could break down. I know that the goal today was what should we know about Black Lives Matter. Um, I will maybe end with, with this in my portion of the conversation is that Black lives do matter every single day, every single Black life matters. Um, and I hope that you will join us in that understanding and know that that also does not mean that lives that are not Black do not matter. Black lives matter inherently means all lives matter. It's saying that at this moment you're showing us that our life is lesser than. So we're reminding you Black lives matter. Thank you so much, Latasha. Ellen, do you have a question to start us off? I do. Um, first, I, I want to say I, I was very appreciative of what you, what you talked about, because um, it's very important. And I wish that a lot of my um, fellow Wabash brothers would be able to hear this. Um, oh, I, I think it would really you. help them in their opinions and what they value. 
Um, I did have a question. Um, what would you say um, to not only, you know, maybe the Wabash brothers here, but it's, of course, we're speaking about the, um, the, the women that we're talking, or the women that you're talking to. Um, how would you consider this, you know, for first time voters or people who this might not be their first rodeo voting? Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is a very, very important election in this country's history. Yes. Um, how would you take into account, you know, some of the decisions that can be made? Um, and then, you know, who people are advocating for when they're speaking of like what Black Lives Matter and what the, what the you know, the president will be able, um, whether it's, you know, Donald Trump, whether it's Joe Biden, um, mm -hmm. whether it comes from, you know, a different party as well. Right. Um, how, how would you say you can, what, what's some things that you believe can help um, people make a very good decision when it comes to, you know, voting someone in office who also cares about the policies and the race relations here in this country? Right. Well, I think that's a great question. And it's a conversation that I've been having with many people <laughs> as we're getting closer. I'm, get, I'm actually working election day um, at the polls. And so as we're getting closer and these conversations are happening, um, that's something that I'm talking about a lot. And, and I would say this to to those uh, of your brothers at Wabash, I would say, share your stories because stories matter and stories often lead people to movement and to change. And so share your stories. If you're talking to people who are undecided at this point, share your story, help them to understand how this affects you because if they're white, let's be honest, it's not affecting them in the same way. So share your story, share how this affects you, how it's a direct impact into your life. And, you know, when I talk to people about who are you voting for, which I don't ask, but if, you know, it's like, I don't know who I'm voting for, both people are bad, which is what you hear so many times. I always say to people, um, I, say, I tell them this, if you're looking at humanity and you're looking at what the needs of humanity are, healthcare, education, access, women's rights, looking at homelessness, social um, and mental disorders, we have to have somebody who A, understands those, B, understands policy and how policy is developed and changed and who can actually understand um, what, what the plight of our, our country is. The voice of Black Lives Matter, this movement is so loud, I do not understand how people still aren't hearing it. Only that I understand it's willful ignorance, right? That they're choosing to not hear. But we need somebody who is understanding and hearing the collective voice. This isn't a few people, this is global. Mm -hmm. Um, so in that I say, I have told my, my, the people that I'm around, vote humanity, vote humanity. That to me should say all of the things that I can't say, <laughs> you know, <laughs> in certain areas or certain, certain realms, vote humanity, understand the issues also be an educated voter. Don't go to the polls, not having understood what the issues are that you are voting directly for because that's exactly what's happening when you go and you cast your vote you are directly voting for policy legislation you cannot be uneducated going to the polls know what the issues are mm -hmm. and i one thing that gets badly overlooked right now too um just obviously this goes without saying but we're not electing one person we're right. electing yes candidates. Montgomery County alone. Yes, absolutely. Those are the ones that will have a lot of impact on how we are able to function as a community and even over the next 10 years because of the census this year. Right. And those, those candidates should really be researched too. Yes. It isn't, you know, we all, everybody plays it like a, a sports contest with no ending, right? The big right. national. But all of those senatorial races, all the congressional, mm -hmm. state, and and our local people, yeah, judges. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Know your know who your local um, 
candidates are, have researched them so that you know what their position is, what their heart is, what their goal is, um, so that you're not, it frustrates me to no end people who vote against their own interests thinking they're voting exactly the way that they should be. It's like, oh my gosh, you are so convinced of something from, mm -hmm. from whoever that is actually not true. You're literally voting against your own. You are a poor person and you're voting against all of the things you actually need, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. helping people to understand what that, the, the difference, helping them to understand and to, to kind of parse out um, is, is really helpful. So you meant, you talked about, uh, Latasha, you talked about uh, systemic racism, poverty, mm -hmm. the, the need for change, dismantling and rebuilding the system, uh, you know, from the, the top down. Um, it, it makes me think of like, historically, America has had so many challenges, in, 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 individual challenges, very things that now in retrospect almost look like really obvious, simple things. I saw... Um, Chris Rock said the other day, sitting at the counter, sitting at the lunch counter was the bare minimum. Right. And, and he's right. That, that was right. not a big ask. Right. Um, so, so we had things like, uh, you know, okay, now, you're, now you're, you're free. Now you can own land. Now you can sit at the lunch counter, whatever. And after each and every one of these hurdles, you would hear the, uh, the, the white majority sing in unison, okay, racism is solved now, shut up, go away. Right. And of course, nobody was looking at the big, big, big picture, which, which is what you were getting into in terms of like the, the really the system. And, right. and, and after each of these steps, obviously, they would go right back and create rules to just replace them and, and right. you know, nonsense. But my question, I guess, is, uh, how how confident are you that the the right people in the right positions are finally seeing that big big picture ooh yeah well here's what i have to say to that we the people <laughs> because i don't know that oftentimes the right people are in the right positions. I think that us voting and voting well certainly helps that. But what we have seen so sadly is that people get to a position of power and then get a little bit more power and the things that were so important maybe are less important now or they're having to compromise so much we're not seeing enough of a change. So my goodness, I hope that we are getting the right people in those positions. But more importantly, I think we, the people, have to continue to push so that even if the wrong people are in office, they still have to make the right decisions. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So um, Because you're exactly right. You're, we are so disproportionately disadvantaged as people of color that, okay, I can own a house. Wonderful. I have no generational wealth, which you may have because of people that look like me. You know what I mean? So in so many ways, we're so disproportionately disadvantaged that it's like those things that people see as success or progress, they are progress. It's always moving forward, but you cannot then, because there's progress, ignore the fact that the disadvantages are so large, right? So, so I hope that as, as a collective, we will not be quiet, that we will not, you know, allow um, the, the progress, <clears throat> excuse me, the progress that we're making to stop. Because I think this is a time that we have momentum to see what Martin Luther King and those freedom writers and all of the wonderful, wonderful people before us didn't get to see because they were just trying to get to the point of being to be able to be at a lunch counter versus us who are saying there is inherently systems, policing, legislation, um, law that are not, did not have us in mind. 
So those things need to change. It's not just you gave me the right to sit on the lunch counter or I can drink from the same water fountain as you. That's great, we got there, but they had to worry about so many of those things. Now we get to say, okay, let's look at this big thing and let's start piece by piece dismantling it and making it what it should be for all people. Very good. Beautifully said. Yeah. Have a question? Uh, well, yes. Uh, yesterday, well, I'm, I'm um, working early voting. Uh -huh. and it's been record turnout. This yes. Went to over 400 every day. Wow, that's amazing. Over 400. I know, I've been signing those ballots. <laughs> you know? Anyway, so the interesting thing is the attitude of the voters, you know, there some most of them thank us for about you know the poll workers there. Yes. Um, there's a couple that you know obviously don't want a person of color looking at their information or seeing how they're you know even though I don't see how they vote, I don't care as long right. as they vote <laughs> safely and legally. That's all I care about. Right. So the. But what makes my day is the people, the first time voters, which so, there's been several first time voters over the age of 75. <laughs> been, oh, wow. Lady oh. Yesterday, who's going to be 100 years old next month. She's been voting over 70 years. Oh, wow. I'm so excited. I held up the line. I said, What was it like your first time voting? Yes. And she teared up because she said, I went with my mother and dad. Oh, wow. And the, the emotion. That went through her, and she started tearing up. I started tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> Over my mask, my mask getting all soggy and everything because it was so right. beautiful. But I could see in her eye the memory of going to vote first time with her parents. Yeah, and she was awesome. born to hear that it was legal for women to vote. It became right. legal for women to vote, and mm -hmm. so and but from her era, her parents took her because mother and dad. That's what she said. Mother and dad made sure I went to vote, and so. That's the the beauty of it, and the fact that we don't have that. Yeah, you know, the, yeah. That's why I work at the polls. Yeah, you know the fact that we didn't ha we don't have those memories. Right. You know, my memory of my first time voting was being intimidated by poll watchers. Uh -huh. Three or four of them asking me, "Are you sure, girl? You know that's your address." Right. Yeah. Be, and so, but I didn't say, well, pooey on it, dust it, you know, and accept that. No, I want to work in the public, make sure that others aren't treated the way. Yes, I absolutely. absolutely. You know, that's why I, you know, why, why do you do this? You know, even though physically I can't do it every day, I at least do one day a week this time. Right. Because I have a aunt, a great aunt, who was brought from, a plantation when she was four years old the last year years of the Civil War. Wow. My her brother brought her from a plantation and rescued her from a plantation at Virginia, I brought her all the way to Indiana and told her if you let them see you, they will take you back. Mm. And he was and this was 1864. She did not leave the homestead until 1962, she did not step foot off that land. She was never counted in, because she was a escaped slave ship, there was no paper. Right. So she had to stay hidden. She was never counted in the census. She, was ne she never married, she never stepped foot in church because brother said, wow. if you step off, they'll take you back. Yeah. I don't know what she saw, you know, and I got to meet her. Wow. I, you know, because I, you know, I was seven when she passed. So I remember her sitting in the corner in the rocking chair with the, with the, her skin, ebony colored skin, was super soft. And yeah. she, she broke our hair, but her legs were always swollen from way back from all the miles she had walked. She had always wow. had trouble with her legs. Yeah. So her first trip downtown, my dad took, and, her, and his dad took her to buy tobacco at Francis Mac, she liked to chew tobacco. Oh, wow. And then, so they actually say, 
candy do you want to go downtown mm -hmm. well yes i did they put her in the old packard and wrapped her up and took her drove zero miles an hour took her downtown right. <laughs> i mean she was only two blocks from the Bethel ame church and she never was there she never wow. went to school she saw everything look at that that is the mm -hmm. best house well look at that well there it is so, you know we need to make sure others hear that story and yes. yeah. know the kids and the young people hear it and they are getting inspired to say we don't shrug off that it is so important. That is a privilege. It is a privilege to get to vote because people can sacrifice so much. Yes, their literal lives. Yeah. They're literally lives. You know, we're shot down as they voted, as they came from the voting booth, or were humiliated when they went to vote. Right. You know, even though they we're told that, okay, you're equal, you know, you're equal, but we're denied because voting was the true e equalizer in power. Right. The white men realized that. They, we had to have the because if the black men got the vote, they couldn't control that. So that, that's why they had to make sure right. we didn't yes. vote. Mm -hmm. So Natasha, that we need that information. Yeah, Marco, do you have a question? Yeah. How many steps in advance uh, is the movement in terms of uh, looking forward planning? Uh, are we looking at uh, how to keep the momentum into 2021 mm -hmm. and uh, hold various politicians accountable for their promises actions uh, or is it more of a you know action in real time at this point uh, focusing all you know the bulk of energy time and resources on the immediacy of uh, the election for example so um both <laughs> the answer is both. It's how do we continue to have the fire and and direct action, but also what are we looking, what are the goals in the next year, three years, five years, right? And so, and you, again, you can go online and you can look at the website. It's going to show you like, here's where we are. Here's what's happening. Here's the things that we're trying to do, right? What we're trying to accomplish. And so it's both of those things. There's such, there has been such a, a, a a furious, um, the furious longing, you know, of of uh, this liberation that you see all of these people coming together, and so the movement is definitely, and the organization definitely saying, how do we continue to have this kind of passion, and how do we keep people engaged in this kind of passion? What about the negative? I'm sorry. What about the negative, like in Washington State, how the sheriff's organizations are are disassociating themselves with um, a local clinic because it said black they were propagating black lives matter and so they're no longer getting referrals from the sheriff's office and when i say well because you support this right so how do, how do you battle that kind of negative so yeah so i think we have to i think this this goes right in line with your question marco about you know what are we doing now what are we going to continue to do when you see things like that a it's it's battling the disinformation so it's mm -hmm. it's refuting no this is who we are this is what we do you consistently see that this is who we are and what we do so it's battling that disinformation and it's also calling the people who are in power and in control to say here are the things that are happening and we're not going to stop bothering you until something changes right that's the agitation that just keeps you just keep on pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. And, and you know, I think with in all of this, the amazing um, fervor that we've seen and the passion that we've seen from people, there have been recently statistics, right, that have said, you know, the, the um, support for Black Lives Matter by white people is down like 25% from the summer. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I read that and I thought, oh man, I don't want to get discouraged in reading this. And then I took a moment and I said, you know what? I said, this is not because people have stopped believing. It's that they get tired and life happens. So mm -hmm. in the movement, it's looking at how do we help that, combat that, right? That kids are now back in school or you're doing virtual learning. Things are, you know, summer. That was a time when it was like, okay, no school. We can do these things. We can engage. But now that 
fall has returned and the right. pandemic is still here and we're getting into flu season and you've got all of these other things that are now battling for your attention. How do you continue to stay engaged? And so in, for me in many ways, what I've been trying to, to um, help my people with is to say, okay, if you can't go out and protest, what else can you do? What's the next thing? Because we were always the movement. We were always understanding that eventually this is going to die down because life, this is eventually going to die down, but how do you redirect that? So that's where you get into writing letters, making phone calls, working the polls, getting out the vote, you know, getting engaged civically in organizations that are going to help promote and, and move the cause. So it's just a redirect. I, I try not to get discouraged when I see like, oh man, there aren't as many whatever protest marches, sit-ins, rallies, etc. Because you can redirect that energy mm -hmm. and it's just as effective. Yeah. Bravo. Alan, please. Uh, yeah, um, I know we had just talked about um, voting, which um, I did my early voting on Saturday, which is my Woo first time. <laughs> um, Yay! And in the contrast, you can see how a lot of people are, they could be deterred because some of the lines are very long when they go out to vote. Some people, yes. you know, it's cold outside. Um, but my question comes more about um, when, when speaking to someone who might not understand what Black Lives Matter means or, un, or has heard about the organization is having a very hard time separating the organization from the movement, mm -hmm. um, as you see protests, what would you say, you know, to, to um, someone who feels like, you know, Black Lives Matter is going against the, the, the saying of like, all lives matter, um, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, and, and a lot of people's opinions, could be you know seen as like a, a terrorist organization or something oh, absolutely. Like that. so so what would you say um to someone who might think that way and you know how they can kind of combat that way of thinking sure especially in you know a very important time right now i think one of the first things that i try to help people realize is that this isn't an extreme group right so you said terrorists I've heard so many terms, Marxist, socialist, like all of the things. I try to dissuade that understanding, right? That this isn't an extreme group. And the way I do that is I talk about Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. So, hey, um, what, did, what do you think about Martin Luther King Jr.? Do you think he did you know, good things? Because most of the time people are gonna be like, oh my goodness, yes, Martin Luther King Jr. And it's all the gushing, which I gush. Martin Luther King Jr. was amazing. I also think Malcolm X was amazing. So, I mean, there's, there's, you know, lots of thoughts and feelings that I have, but to say, this is the exact same thing. This is the exact same thing. And so if you are saying, oh yeah, I would have been right there with Martin Luther King Jr. Then you should be right here with Black Lives Matter <laughs> because it's literally the same thing. It is an extension of what he started. So, and understanding that this is a collective, it is black liberation, absolutely. It's mm -hmm. the, the phrase is black lives matter, but it is collective liberation, understanding that within systems of oppression, we all suffer. So how do we stop the systems of oppression? How do we upend supremacy culture? And how do we make real change? So oh. in, inherently, as I said, in black lives matter, is all lives matter. Mm -hmm. But right now, the focus, it's like the, the example of, you know, the fire department coming out and starting to spray every house when only one house is on fire. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you race, waste the resources of the water on all of these houses that aren't burning? Right mm -hmm. now, our house is burning. And so that's why Black Lives Matter. <laughs> great analogy. I like that. Yeah. That's great. Great analogy. I'm Latasha. As a person who wants to be and tries to be an ally, um, are, there, are there things that the white community, the white allies are doing that, you know, with the best of intentions that they think are beneficial and supportive, but perhaps are not, or maybe are even counter? So I think the what I would say to that is I I am the type of person and not everybody agrees with me on this. I would rather you show up and get it wrong than you not to show up at all. 
So you can learn if you're willing to learn and you're willing to listen, which is really important because sometimes what happens with allyship is that people get so excited with the new information that they have that they think now I'm the teacher. And it's like, no, no, you still the student. <laughs> you still are the student and you still aren't leading this thing. So, right, you have to kind of take that, I don't want to say back seat, but you take a, you, you come to the side of somebody and you support them while they lead. And so I would say in, a, you know, maybe ways that they're not doing it correctly or whatever, all of that's teachable if you have a teachable spirit. If you have a heart that, if you are a true ally, you're going to have those things. Your your heart's going to be open. You're going to want to learn. You'll be willing to listen and be quiet. You'll you'll do all of those things. If not, it's performative allyship, and all it is is so that you can look good and say, "I did this thing, and now I feel better about myself." Right? And so, if it's true allyship, you're going to have all of those qualities already. And I think, you know, again, show up if you get it wrong. Be, be able to be teachable and to be corrected and continue in the fight and continue being a support and always saying, how can I help? What can I do? And listen, really listen to that. I think that is so important. I have talked to so many people that I think you're not listening to me and I can tell. Mm -hmm. I can tell because all you're wanting to do is refute what I'm saying. And so in your mind right now, you're just coming up with why that can't be true or how that's not true, or why that's a lie, or why that's not a fact, or whatever. And so um, listening is so vital. So, so vital. Oh, very good. I had, um, uh, when you're talking a lot about the organization, um, it was pretty important to me when you spoke a little bit about like the nonviolent civil disobedience aspects of um, a lot of the different a lot, a lot of what the what the movement does, especially when we see how you related it back to the MLK and Malcolm X yeah. um, in class currently right now um, with uh, Dr. Sabrina Thomas. I'm not sure if you you met her or not, but um, I don't I don't know her. Yeah, um, she um, she teaches the it's a it's a, it's a history class, um, and we're kind of talking about you know some of the things such as civil disobedience that have gone on in the lives of um, Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. as well as uh, Malcolm X. And so my question would kind of be to people who are trying to understand the Black Lives Matter movement now who don't really, you know, feel like they want to sacrifice and have those kind of access to disobedience be on their record if they go to jail or they get locked up because they, you know, they're out past curfew or something like that. Right. Um, how, how do you kind of inspire someone who is, you know, kind of on the fence about doing something like that, especially when you want to, you want to, give back and you want to be a part of the protest and you want to you know have a voice um but you're kind of scared of the the, the repercussions that could come with you know being a part of this uh, not just you know in in the um law enforcement but you know just in, in your own life so right uh, to that i would say here's a list of things that you can do to help <laughs> I literally do that for people who are like, you know, I don't know how to, how to engage, or I don't know how, what to do. If, if, if you don't want to come out and march or come to a protest, I would also say this as a caveat, actually, know what it is you're going to, because there are like sit-ins, there are rallies, there are protests, there are marches. So all of these direct action things, they're levels, right? So they're, they're not all the same. So the things in Crawfordsville are so calm. They're so peaceful. I would say anybody could go to those and feel comfortable and not feel like their life's going to be threatened. They're going to go to jail or anything like that. So that's maybe the first thing. But the second thing is not everybody is built for that. And that's okay. It's why we have eyes and hands and feet and they all do different things. So that's okay if you don't want to go do that. Here's 10 different things that you can do to be involved. And if you want a list of those, I can send those out to Marco or whoever can get you, get that to you. Um, or I guess I have the email with everybody. I can send out kind of my go-to, here are the things and ways that you can get involved. If you don't want to participate in direct action, you can still be very involved in the movement and in affecting change. Thank you. I, I think that would be very great um, just to kind of pass on uh, maybe some of my brothers here at Wabash College and some people back in my community back in Indianapolis 
who feel sure. like they don't go and protest, um, that they're not doing their job as somebody who's an ally. Um, yeah. But, you know, there's, there's other things that they can do um, to kind of help this movement and, you know, drive racial equality here in the United States. And education is a huge part of that too, you know, just understanding the, the facts, understanding the issues, and then helping to be an educator in that way, you know? So uh, I think for people who are wanting to do that, who don't have the black experience, I would say, you know, there's some things you maybe need to read first, um, but um, education is huge. Like just helping, I was sitting at, um, uh, this was after we voted, actually. My husband and I went and voted early and we went to get a celebratory drink afterwards because we were so excited. And um, nobody was in this place that we were in because we, pandemic, we haven't been going anywhere. Um, so we looked in, nobody was in there. We were like, okay, we can do this real quick. And the bartender was talking to us about how um, mail-in voting and absentee ballots and how that's different and how there's fraud and all of these things. And I, I thought, okay, here we go. And so we went into this whole conversation and I started talking to him about, and he said, oh my gosh, I've, I've had all of this information wrong. And I said, yeah, you have, but now you have good information. And so now you get to help propagate that you know and so education i think is is a huge point part of this too and we can education all do that is always the answer yep that's what we i tell my kids <laughs> yes yeah yeah no beautifully said and one thing ellen and and latasha i wanted to ask you too it seems to me that it's just been beautiful to see all the activity intellectual activity that is surrounds this and partly it's because it's like third wave feminism to second as you described yes. Sit in, but now we can be attentive. And the number of books that have sold this summer, and the that we all oh read, Andy, and that we read, uh, my mother, the Detroit numbers, and yes. kinds of beautiful books are selling like crazy, and people are being attentive to black-owned businesses, or at least that's what I'm hopeful. I mean, I follow hopeful news because I yes. need that, right. Yes. But, but I, it seems to me that that's different. And as the only person of those of us who are still here, who was a person in the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. right? Back in the 60s, what we couldn't have quite understood is at least those of us who were allies, not in the community, is that how, what that systemic thing meant. I mean, it felt like in 64 and 65 that things had been achieved. Right. And I, that what is so brilliantly hopeful about this movement now. Right. It's, I, it's the 400 years and the 75 years. Yes. The way I could not. I could not agree with you more. I think Civil Rights Act was passed in 64, huge win, right? Huge victory. But yep. again, it's like, you can't ignore all of the stuff before that, that put people where they are today. You know, the over-policing of black communities, these, it's poverty. There's poverty and homelessness. It's not people just committing crimes because they wanna commit crimes because crime is so cool when you don't have any other options because of poverty and homelessness and mental disorders what is there el what else is there right you know so it's addressing all of those issues and why do we have that because you start so far behind the finishing line that you cannot get yourself out of it right exactly. so it's like it's so much deeper so much deeper yeah yeah and the wealth the generational wealth and i'm glad you yes. were uh, several times, Latasha. I mean, what a, you know, takes people a while to get that in their heads, what it that does. Really yeah, yeah. No, people didn't choose to get in the ghetto. There are things right. like, <laughs> oh gosh, any rate. Uh, Al, it means so much to us to have the, our beautiful, beloved MXI represented in yes. such a person. Oh, yeah. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you so much for your questions and for your um, participation in this. 
I love to see young people getting out and being involved and active. And really, so many of the things that I, I got to attend this summer were led by 18 to 21 year olds, which was quite incredible. And I, you know, oh, President Obama says all the time, young people are leading us. And so, you know, not that I ever want you guys to feel like this is on you because it's not, it's on all of us. But boy, the innovation, the ingenuity, the creativity that you guys bring and the, the, en the energy is just amazing. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Um, Latasha, I just wanted to say thank you. I really, really appreciate uh, the education, the information. Uh, Latasha, just uh, excellent to meet you and, and I can't thank you enough. Alan, great to meet you. Thank you for joining us and, and it, it's, been a, it's been a fun one. It's well, thanks so much for having stuff. me. I appreciate the reach out and I'm thoroughly enjoyed being part of this conversation and I'm so thankful that we're, we're having these conversations. They are so needed. Well, everybody, thank you for the lovely session. And um, I encourage everyone who's watching us uh, at this point, in case you haven't gotten the message, <laughs> in case you haven't, and in case uh, you're for the election. But even if you're watching after the election, be sure that you're registered to vote. Be sure that you understand your issues. Thank you all again, Latasha and Alan and Marco and Vicki. This has been a wonderful discussion. Thank you for your leadership, Latasha. And we look forward to seeing everyone in December for our next virtual lunch with the league. Mm -hmm.